this happened a long time ago, when I was about four or five. I'm 15 now. Looking back at the situation, I really think I should have seen the red flags about this guy, but since I was really young and stupid, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I just thought he was a very kind and normal guy. The whole thing happened in the mall, in plain sight, in front of hundreds of people. I had gone with my mother shopping. A nice little girl's day out. You get the gist. At some point, though, I got lost in the mall. Very typical. Everyone has a story like that, right? And so far, no red flags at all. I remember seeing a guy with a very southeastern accent. I assumed he was from somewhere like India. He was dressed like a junkie, but my five-year-old mind didn't know that. I thought he looked fine. So, since I was a lost five-year-old little girl who didn't know any better, I walked right up to him and asked him for directions, if he had seen my mommy, etc. He ignored my questions, and when he saw me, his eyes lit up. He immediately started showering me with compliments. Some of them were even inappropriate to say to a five-year-old kid. He gave me a pink and black bracelet and told me how well it looked on me. Of course, I was oblivious to the situation and ignoring all red flags. So, at some point, he offers to take me to his fake private jet and fly me off to Jamaica to relax and play with the dolphins all day. Basically, just describing a child's paradise. All I had to do was get in his car. Of course, since it sounded like a dream come true, I trusted him and almost went into the car with this creep. I kid you not though, at the exact moment he was about to take me away from the mall, some man with a suit and tie stopped him dead in his tracks. Hey, what are you doing with a five-year-old girl? You could easily tell we weren't related. He had a dark skin tone and I was very pale. Add to that, he was dressed like a junkie. It probably set off an alarm in the fancy man's head. The man responded in his raspy southeastern accent. Oh, this is just my daughter's kid. I'm taking her home, you know. We were clearly not related, and so the fancy guy immediately asked him where my mom was. I told him she was still in the mall, and from that point on, there was some fierce arguing between the two men. I didn't get most of it, but I ended up with the well-dressed man, and the junkie cursed him out. We went to the lobby of the mall and found my mom there, telling the worker behind the desk my description. She had clearly picked up by this point that I was long gone. It turned out that the guy in the suit was a security guard at the mall and had picked up on how wrong the situation was. When my mom saw me with this guy, she picked me up and hugged me. This story is in fact very old, but I just recently got reminded of it because one of my friends told me they were planning on going to Jamaica for vacation and the memories just came flooding back to me. So security guard who noticed how wrong the situation was and stepped in to help. Thank you. Alright, so this is a bit of an essay, but a lot happened, so bear with me. My next door neighbor's parents moved from India to the UK way back in the 60s. After retiring, they made a habit of heading back there every year to visit family and friends, ultimately spending around half their time traveling through India and half of their time here. Long story short, one year they decided to invite my family along. I was 15, now I'm 25, and thought I was some badass Viking rock prince because I had long blonde hair and red Kerrang. A fun fact. Curly hair ruins everything. I look like some kind of fucking cherub. Now my neighbor's dad has planned this holiday like it's a military campaign. When we arrive, he hands each of us, including my 11-year-old brother and sister, a brown folder containing our itinerary, hotel brochures, money conversion charts, train timetables, four passport photos of ourselves for other forms, and a list of names under the header of useful people. Forget Viking rock prints. I feel like James Bond. Other than the fact that I was mistaken for a girl on several different occasions, I had a pretty amazing time. Until, we rock up to this huge hotel in the middle of the jungle. 
honestly the arse end of nowhere. The nearest village is a three hour drive down a dirt road, just before sunset, in the fucking jungle. I pull out the brochure. It'd be safe to say that this place was under new management. There's a single light on about five stories up. As we pull into the drive, we spot a group of men clustered around a large fire. One of them stands and starts shouting something, but is silenced by the guy next to him with a slap to the back of his head. One of the group came sauntering over and motioned to our driver to roll down the window. Imagine Alfred Hitchcock as an Indian drug lord, and you'll have a pretty good idea of the man now flapping his jowls through our window. He peers into the back, spots us, and cracks the dictionary definition of a shit-eating grin. In broken English, he welcomes us to the hotel, glances over our reservations, and ushers us into the lobby. This is when shit gets really weird. The place was deserted. Not... The staff have all gone to bed deserted. It was like whoever was here fucking noped out of this place in a hurry deserted. There were toppled chairs in the lobby even. Hitchcock tells us that our rooms weren't ready. It was now 9pm and offers us some food while we wait. The dining room is huge, empty, and our order is taken by a boy no older than 9 who promptly vanishes, closing the doors behind him. We hear a motorbike engine outside, and an hour later, something vaguely resembling our order appears on a variety of mismatched dinnerware. No idea where any of it came from. At this point, we were all pretty unnerved, and everyone started making lame jokes to help ease the tension. We were only there for one night. Everything had been paid for in advance, and we were a very large group, 11 in total with two people who spoke Hindi and Konkani, so we felt pretty sure we could deal with any weirdness just fine. Hitchcock waddles in and takes us to our rooms. Every one of them has been stripped bare, apart from the beds and bedside tables. Exposed wires poke out of the walls where you'd expect a TV or phone, and there are rectangular patches of discolored wallpaper, suggesting that someone finally took a stand against terrible hotel artwork. The only decoration was this creepy little metal horse that was just sitting on one of the bedside tables. I'm sharing with my little bro and insist on taking the bed closest to the door, presumably thinking I could summon Thor's wrath if things got hairy. Hitchcock lingered in our doorway for a while, flashing his pearly browns and giving me these rape eyes. I closed the door on him. We dumped our bags, checked the door was locked, and had bro chats until we pass out. I wake up, no clue when, and clocks clearly didn't fit in with the whole minimalist cracked in vibe the management were going for, but it was pitch black. To hear the door to my room clicking shut, the door that's no further than a foot from my head. Fuck that. I'm no viking rock prince, I'm a flying baby that plays a harp. I cower under the surprisingly clean blankets until my heart stops, threatening to bust out of my ribs and redecorate the ceiling. I stealthily ninja roll out of my bed and to the door. The bastard is unlocked. Fuck this. I barricade that shit with the bedside table. And check little bro is still alive. Get into bed, see our bags, add them to the barricade. Notice that mine is open. Fuck everything. Plot twist though. Nothing's missing. Camera, wallet, clothes, super secret spy dossier. Everything's intact. I convinced myself that I shat my pants over nothing and just went back to sleep. Side note, somehow my little bro slept through the entire thing. Morning comes and we all want to get out of there as fast as possible. Neighbor's dad kicks off about how weird the whole thing was to Hitchcock and gets about half of our money back. Excellent. We head outside and my sister points out there's charred remains of one of the hotel beds and what's left of the fire pit. Excellent. Turns out that our driver, who had had a room in the place, had decided to sleep in the bus because he, in his own words, didn't want their funny business. Apparently, there were people coming and going all night. He woke up to see a guy, nose against the window, just staring at him. Driver hit the window and the dude scampered off into the jungle like some kind of evil Mowgli. We give the driver an extra huge tip. Hitchcock waves at us from the lobby 
adjusts his crotch and plods back in. We leave, thinking the weirdness is all over. Shyamalan territory. About an hour into the journey, I decided to take a look at our itinerary, so I pulled out my little spy folder. My heart instantly sinks. One of my passport photos is gone. A perfect 35 by 45 millimeter rectangle missing from the corner. Three little Viking rock cherubs stare up at me, warning their fallen brother. I search the folder, ask my parents if they took it for something. I start losing my shit. Everything from the night before rushes back. I explain what happened and there's this weird moment of silence while everyone looks at each other with concern. Turns out that everybody heard someone outside and at their door at some point during the night, but it all deadbolted them before going to sleep. Bro and I had no deadbolt, though. Hitchcock put us in that fucking room on purpose. The driver suggests we head back to the hotel and demand satisfaction. Tips galore for driver there. When we arrive back at the hotel, though, all the doors are padlocked shut. Hitchcock and his cronies have all vanished. The cherry on top of this mindfuck cake is the horse. The little metal horse that sat on our bedside table had been placed on the step in front of the doors. I took it. Free souvenir, so fuck you, Hitchcock. Okay, so I've only ever really lurked on Reddit before. And I guess I never really thought I'd have a story for Let's Not Meet. But my friends pushed me to share this, so here goes, I guess. About a week ago, I was leaving my boyfriend's house at around 2am. I should have probably just stayed over, but I had a busy day the next day and wanted to go home and sleep in my own bed. So I'm maybe 5 minutes away from his house when I'm stopped at a red light. A car pulls up in the lane next to me, and an old woman motions for me to roll down the window. She looks scared and frantic, and she's just an old lady, so of course I rolled it down. Only, after I start to roll down the window, I see someone else in the passenger seat. It was dark, but I could make out enough to see that it was another woman who looked like another old woman, so I didn't think much of her. Once my window was about a quarter of the way open, I wasn't going to roll it down any further, and they started talking to me. My daughter just got in an accident, and I need to get to the hospital, but I'm about to run out of gas. Please, I just need anything you have. I need gas. I can't get there. Now, the hospital is very close by. I didn't realize it at the time, but the hospital was closer to where we were than any gas station. If she turned in right instead... She would have gotten to the entrance of the hospital in two minutes, maybe less. But that's not what I was thinking. Here was this old lady who seemed frazzled and frantic and worried. I thought about how my mom can get crazy in high-stress situations too. I told them I didn't have any cash on me, but that there was a gas station maybe five minutes up the road. It was late though, so I said I didn't know if it was still open. The woman in the passenger seat immediately chimed in. It is. Could you meet us there? This was my first real indication that something wasn't quite right. How would she know that it was still open? And why was she so quick to answer? Why wouldn't they have any money on them either? At this point though, all I really thought was that they wanted money from me. I didn't want any trouble, so I figured I'd go and get them a 20 from the ATM or something and be on my way. Besides, what if her daughter really was in an accident and they really did need the help? So, I start driving. I call my boyfriend, just so I have someone on the phone who knows what's happening, just in case. By the third time he doesn't pick up, I'm getting worried. I call another friend who doesn't pick up either. I can't have no one know where I am. I plan to myself that if no one else is at the gas station, I'll just pull out and speed away. I probably should have left anyway, but again, I didn't want any trouble. I figured I'd just give them some money and that would be that. We pull up and I see two cars in the gas station and one girl outside pumping gas. I felt a little better knowing people were around, so I parked right in front of the little gas station store. The two old women pull up to the gas pump nearest to me. 
The woman I talk to stays in the car with the car running, while the other woman gets out and starts walking towards my car. This is when I panic. This other woman, who I couldn't really see in the darkness at night, was not very old, and she was big. I don't mean fat. I mean she looked insanely strong. She was much bigger than I was, and was walking towards my car with a smile on her face. I open my door and yell at her to stay back, to stay near her car. She stops as I get out of my car and tell her I'll get the money from the ATM, and that'll be it. At this point, the other cars had pulled away, and I'd rather be inside with a cashier than out here or in my car. She walks towards me again. She really needs the money for parking at the hospital. Our friend is very hurt. Please. Their story changed. Obviously, this was not right. I yelled at her once again. Stop walking! I told her if she came any closer, I'd call the police. She walked back to her car, and I ran to the gas station store. At this point, I was crying. I tried to tell the cashier, but there seemed to be a big language barrier, which wasn't helped at all by me crying. A man then comes into the store, and I tell him what's happening. I tell him I'm just going to get money from the ATM and give it to them, that I just want them to leave me alone, and I ask him to please make sure I get to my car safe. He seemed very sympathetic and walked me back out to my car. He told the woman to stay away from me, and even offered to give me my $20 back. I said no and thanked him for making sure I was okay. I get back in my car and pull fast away. It's all over, I think. I come out of the parking lot and I have to wait at another red light. I can still very much see the gas station and the woman's car. I watch as the woman goes back into her car with the money and they pull away from the pump without getting gas. I panic as they pull up right behind my car at the light. At this point, my phone is almost dead from trying to call everyone I know. As the light turns green and I drive down the road, past the turn for the hospital, I'm terrified to see their car is still following right behind me. At this point, I'm only thinking of the worst things happening. I didn't have enough battery on my phone to call 911 and be able to explain where I am. Instead, I turn my brightness all the way up and try to show me on the phone through my back window in the hopes they think I'm calling the police. I guess it must have worked. Thankfully, they immediately turned and stopped following me. I drove all the way home going 80 and crying my eyes out. I didn't stop for a single red light. I'm not sure exactly what these women were after, but I felt they had evil intentions and that it didn't stop after the money. I know it wasn't smart of me talking to them in the first place, but when you think it's just an old lady needing help, it's hard to think that she could be thinking of hurting you. I hate telling people not to help others, but if it's dead in night, trust no one. I'm not from an English-speaking country first off. I'm a female college student, and I live with my family in an apartment in a big city. Where I come from, it's pretty normal to just go to the college right near your house. This happened on a weekend, when my family and I had planned a trip abroad, but last minute I had an exam rescheduled for that Monday, so I decided not to go with them. It's Thursday, and my parents and siblings are leaving for the airport. A guy that they usually hire is taking them there. My mom told me that my maid would be staying with me for the weekend, and that I should call her if I needed anything. I said goodbye and went right back to studying. It was now Thursday, at around 9pm. I'm studying in the living room with my boyfriend, so my maid tells me it's getting late and she's going to bed. I tell her that I'll head off soon too. An hour later, my boyfriend leaves as well. It's now around 10.30pm and I'm getting ready for bed. I grab my dog, a small Yorkie, and take her to my room with me to sleep together. It's now about 11pm, and I'm in my bed looking at my notes, when my dog suddenly starts growling at the door. I told her to shut up because Yorkers are nervous and bark all the time at everything. At least mine does. After she's silent, I suddenly get this adrenaline rush and stay very still. I can hear footsteps echoing down the corridor. The floor is made of wood, so when I hear specific creaks and sounds of wood bending, I know the steps are coming closer to my room. 
At first, I think it's probably my maid making sure my boyfriend didn't stay the night, but when the footsteps stopped at my door, I started to freak out. I was even compelled to call out my maid's name. He's not here, you can come in and check. But somehow I could tell that this was not her. I called my boyfriend and told him someone was in my house. He told me to put on some shoes and check the other rooms. I really didn't want to, but I'm not going to sleep until I was sure there was no one. I find some courage and put on some shoes, start walking very slowly towards my sister's room, and checking with my phone light. I see it's empty. The bathroom is empty. My parents' room is empty. By this time, I was getting more relaxed. I must have imagined it. As I walk into my parents' room, I also see that it's empty. I walk to their house closet and scan the room with my phone light one more time, when suddenly, my light shines on a human figure that was obviously not my maid. I nervously called out her name, but the tall, muscular body answered. No, it's Guy's name, the driver that took my parents to the airport. I freeze and try to act cool, and he invents some petty excuse. Oh, I was just uh, stopping to check the windows were closed. I told him it's late, and he leaves the house. I called my parents to verify this excuse. He was obviously lying. He then had the audacity to hit me up on WhatsApp and ask if I wanted him to drive me to college tomorrow. I never saw him again after that, and to be honest, I hope we don't meet again either. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here, as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. As always, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any criticisms on how I can make the videos better, or any thoughts about it in general, please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. As well, in the description below the video, there will be links to all of my social media, including my Facebook, Gmail, Twitter, and Twitch accounts. If you guys want to chat, please be sure to send me a message on any of those. I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, please be forewarned, though, that I tend to go on Facebook less than the others, so it may take me a little bit longer to respond to you. Uh, if you want to send in a story, or you have a story that you'd like to be read, and please be sure to take a look at the description and send me a message on any one of those sites. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include the name of the story if it has one, the theme of the story if it has one as well, and how you would like to be credited in the video the story appears in, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. And please be sure to include as much detail as you are comfortable with, and make sure to follow proper grammar at least a little bit. Uh, that way it will be easier for me to read, and it will also be long enough to put into a video. If you guys are curious about the music used in the video, it's always listed in the description in the order which it appears, and I have links to the artists as well. I usually use Doblato Studios and Muji, so that's usually what you're going to find there. If you're curious about the art in the video, my art guy Alan always does all of my art for the channel. He's a very good friend of mine, and I have links to all of his social media as well. So if you like his stuff, be sure to check him out. He does commissions as well, I'm pretty sure. So if you like it, you can definitely get some good quality products from him. I don't think there's too much new updates today, uh, other than the fact that I'm very excited for the PlayStation 5 coming out, and I just ordered Pikmin 3 on the Switch, so hopefully that gets here soon. I've been waiting like three years for that because nobody bought a Wii U. So yeah, that's my news for now. Be sure to let me know how you guys are doing as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.